potential is hard to quantify when it comes to wrestling. Is it just technical talent, overwhelming charisma, size, presentation, fan support? Which concoction of these traits magically produces a main eventer and what accident of alchemy produces Shorty G? I don't know, I'm not a wizard, but I do know that if potential is a cocktail of characteristics, then Roman Reigns has always had all of the right ingredients. WWE just never actually managed to mix them into that tall drink of water. Before now. Because heel Roman, the tribal chief, has flipped fan opinion on the most divisive babyface since John Cena, transforming him into the star of one of the most compelling wrestling stories of 2020 and 2021, otherwise known as 2022, Electric Boogaloo but worse, and made in the centerpiece of the Smackdown universe. And fans have actually gone, you know what, yeah, actually, yeah, I accept that, that's fine, I like that. He started out with a yard, and now he's got an island. I'm Laurie Hailing from Parts Fun Known, and this is The Tribal Chief Explained. Before we crack on with this episode though, please do consider giving us a subscribe so you never miss content like this, or you can support us on patreon.com forward slash parts fun known for awesome rewards and early access to all future videos. So when Roman returned at SummerSlam 2020 to attack The Fiend and Braun Strowman after their Universal title clash, you'd be forgiven for thinking that WWE was just doing what they'd always done, putting Roman on top, whether you wanted it or not. And sure, he seemed unusually angry, screaming, you ain't a monster unless I'm here at Braun, bending a chair over his back and spearing the newly crowned champ The Fiend a good few times before saying, I run this bitch. The B word, you can tell he's serious. But Braun and The Fiend were both heels, and Roman had sat out most of 2020 with an enlarged spleen, making it dangerous for him to compete after his recent recovery from leukemia. So there was every possibility that WWE viewed this violence as a babyface thing. It's the Charlotte paradox, as I like to call it. And I do think that people initially chalked it up to being another facet of the badass babyface character, the owner of yards that Roman had been since retiring Taker. Wreck everyone and leave was already written on his t-shirt. You'll never see it coming was the tagline for SummerSlam. It all just felt a little too contrived to be anything other than WWE's latest harebrained scheme to make Roman the guy. Because they'd already had about as many goes at that as Taker had had at retiring and none of those stuck either. So it was a genuine shock when it turned out on SmackDown that Roman Reigns wasn't the guy. He was a Paul Heyman guy, and he was a full-on heel. Suddenly, if you were the kind of fan who had the urge to boo Roman, it all made sense because the character finally reflected the reality. Because after six months of uncertainty with a global pandemic, WWE were returning to the relative safety of Roman with the belt even though fans have been clamouring to see The Fiend get his second bite of the apple for quite some time. Roman wins, lol, which he did at Payback, being both The Fiend and Strowman, so a double f***ing lol. All you gotta do is show up and win. But the magic is, though, that Roman now knew that we hated that idea and he didn't really care. He was doing what he thought was best for himself, best for his family, best for business. Best for us kind of comes in tangentially to that because what do we actually know? Filthy marks that we are. Reigns described it in a shoot interview with CBS Sports like this. I tried to look at it as being a character in a storyline and he has choices like anyone else. Some of his choices are going to be perceived as good, some of them are going to be perceived as bad, and some of them people won't understand because they won't understand where he's coming from. That might be because they're not in the same field or on the same level, kind of like how I told my cousin that he wouldn't understand what it's like to be on top. He never has to operate at the top. He's never been WWE Champion. He's never been Universal Champion. I have many times. Oh, Roman, you filthy heel. And with all of those times on top comes not only a weight of expectation that you would carry the company, you would save the failing viewing figures, you'd do 
all of the media, but also this oppressive pressure of trying to win over a rather hostile fan base. It's the kind of pressure that might twist you in ways that made people uncomfortable. Roman special counsel Paul Heyman put it really well in an interview with Sports Illustrated's media podcast when discussing why Roman didn't turn heel earlier in his career, which everyone was asking for. He said before he looked late 20s, early 30s, and he was still too young. He wasn't grizzled and didn't have any scars. Now you see the wars on his face. You see the pressure and obligation and responsibility and accountability and the sheer burden. That's the cool word when it comes to being the top star in WWE, the burden and the weight and what it's done to Roman Reigns. Four WrestleMania main events, it would have been five if he appeared this year, it will be five when he appears at next year's WrestleMania. Battle scarred, grizzled, burdened. This Roman Reigns has been fighting his entire existence and whether that's fighting opponents, management, the fans, his gruelling schedule, illness. So he comes back. It's like WWE always knew the importance of Roman. Joe, humble though he is, also always knew the importance of Roman. We knew the importance of Roman, though we didn't actually want to admit it. But now Roman knows the importance of Roman and he is tired of people getting in the way of him doing his job. And that job is to keep WWE relevant and make himself and other talent look good. As he told CBS Sports, Roman would say that's the island of relevancy. That's how powerful the character is. And if we can take someone like my cousin, who has been half of the best tag team of my generation and elevate him and put him in the spotlight all the way from just 15 minutes ago, I was talking about him on ESPN First Take, that wasn't happening before. Now we put him in a position to where all eyes are on him. In kayfabe though, his overall goal is as champion to collect the biggest paycheck in order to provide for his family, which is where Samoan culture begins to bleed into this storyline. Our family relies on me being the tribal chief. That's who I am in this life. Because Roman is a member of the Anawai wrestling family, which started with High Chief Peter Maivia, grandfather of The Rock. It was Peter who trained Roman's father, Seeker, and his uncle, Afa, the Wild Samoans, who in turn imparted their wisdom to Roman. We've heard it all before, but it's a proud wrestling lineage with knowledge of this family business being shared across generations. Roman's brother Rosie was also a wrestler. He's cousins with Yokozuna, Umaga and Rikishi. He's the uncle of the Usos. And that history hangs over this storyline. Samoan culture is structured around Fa Samoa, which is translated as the Samoan way which David Tuine, founder of the Lifaleo Samoan Cultural Center, was kind enough to tell me all about. Living in isolation like we do, um, the, the, your, your network, right, which is your immediate network, is your family, is the basis of your survival, right? It's gonna be very difficult for an individual to survive out in these conditions by themselves. That is the, um, <clears throat> the core and the root of this idea that we have as Samoans and it's passed down through generations that the family is the key, right? That you, you, you survive not as an individual, you survive as a family. And you thrive as an individual as you thrive as a community. Family is a very integral part of our psyche, right? We don't survive without our family. And so we do everything that we can to care for our family, take care of these relationships and these bonds that we have. So if Roman sees himself as a matai or a chief, it is his responsibility to provide for his family. And sure, Kevin Owens has used that as a hook for his prize fighter gimmick and Heath Slater has had his I Got Kids t-shirt, but the pressure on a chief is to provide for a whole community and make really tough choices in doing so. There's a saying in Samoa, ole alai le pule, ole tautua. And that what that means is the road to authority is through service. This idea that the, the, the greatest among us is the least, right? The greatest among us is the servant among us. So as, a, as, a, as the head of the family, 
right? There's many uh, um, responsibilities that fall on you to be able to make sure that the family is organized and functioning properly. And they, you know, they, they're bestowed a title um, to govern or have authority to govern the, this, this particular family. But our family depends on me. Our family relies on me being the tribal chief. That's who I am in this life. That's why Jay becoming number one contender should have been a good thing for the family. Because firstly, Jay gets a main event paycheck providing more for the family. And secondly, Jay was likely to lie down, letting Roman hold on to the top spot and that steady paycheck longer. The only thing is, Jay didn't. Why can't I be the one to provide for the family, Oost? Because Jay also wanted to be a provider to make a name for himself apart from his twin brother, and that's why he opened the clash match saying, I'm just trying to get this to Oos. Sounded incredibly white there. Because the spot of the chief was technically still up for grabs because it's something that is bestowed by family unanimously. The, the way that one becomes a chief is just that meaning that the road, to, um, the road to authority is through service. So individuals that display a certain amount, you know, that serve the family, right? They put time and effort to try to keep the family going, you know, doing the chores, all these other things are individuals that other family members will recognize and say, hey, that's a person that, that has displayed the, that their heart is in the right place that they're about the family and making sure that the family is taken care of and that they're not seeking out their own glory or their own opportunities, right? Their own agenda, personal agendas. The way a chief is selected is by family consent. Even if it was father to son, father to son, they still present the son to the family and seek the family's consent. Traditionally, the families would seek 100% consent for this title passing from father to son. And we agree as a family, because you're not a chief unless you have a right family to care for, right? Your title could be a title, but if it's a title without substance, then, you know, it's a bell without a ring. Roman's ascension to the role of tribal chief relies on Jay consenting. So then there's also cultural significance to Jay arriving to this match wearing this red garland because it is symbolic of the ceremonies in which people become Matai. What they call in Samoan, ole fa'aui ole ula. And ula is this, uh, this is also the ula. Uh, fa'aui ole ula is the passing on of the ula to you, from the old to the new, from the dead to the sun and it brings forth the idea that the dad is pleased with the son's service. And so this is where now Roman in Samoan culture really oversteps the mark because not only does he cheat to keep Jay down, a blow to the family jewels of all things, Sorry, the significance alarm is a little bit sensitive these days. But after Jay refuses to quit, refuses to recognize, and it's Jimmy that throws in the towel on his behalf, Roman accepts the Ula from Paul Heyman. He takes the mantle of the Matai without earning the respect that usually goes along with it. So that's why he's pissed at his official ceremony. I don't want you to call me that. I don't want you to acknowledge me as the tribal chief because he didn't acknowledge me. His brother acknowledged me, but he wouldn't acknowledge me. So now Roman is stuck at this crossroads because he did what he had to do to secure his position, but he's lost even more respect for doing it when he went too far with Jay. So his next move is kind of a catch-22 for Jay, because if Jay loses at Hell in a Cell, he has to fall in line, acknowledge the chief for him and his brother, their families and their entire lineage will be removed from the Samoan dynasty. So like, I don't know, choking out Jay's brother, he has to grudgingly respect him. Catch-22. Unless, of course, Jay won. Which was always an option. It wasn't. He didn't. And Roman... 
To quote another inspiration of Romans for this character, Mafia Bosses, I can't do a Brando, but he made him an offer. He can't I don't know what I'm doing. I sound like a frog person. He made him an offer he can't refuse. But the mob influences is a subject for another video. The deeper I don't know why I am by the entire thing, because every step of the process has significance and reflects Samoan culture in a way that is true, enhances the culture, and doesn't resort to lazy tribal stereotyping. Is the Luau over? Did I, I missed it, didn't I? Let Roman Reigns be the tribal chief. What did it sacrifice a uh, sacrifice a goat if you have to? Most of the time. And even if your gripe with all of this is that Roman is the chief and the chief is a heel and that's not as good as presenting all of this stuff in a positive light, there is this lovely subtext to the whole story that Roman, or Joe in this case, is actually out there raising his cousin up into the main event scene, looking out for his family. Now that is how a chief should behave. Thank you so much for watching this video and a special thank you to David for taking the time to speak with me. And if you ever do find yourself in American Samoa and are looking to learn a little bit more about the traditional way of doing things, then please check out the Samoan Cultural Center, all of the details of which can be found in the video description down below. And like I said earlier, the very best way to support Parts Fun Known is on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Parts Fun Known. And at all the different tiers, you get ace rewards like early access to our videos, a fan quizzle mania, and you can even have your name read out by one of us in videos like these lovely $25 backers. Brandon Sires, Brother Bradley, Brian Heath, Bryce Williams, Christian Womble, Dan Cora, Daniel Bridger, Death Envoy, Glenn Dallas, Joe Meyer, John Molden, John Schindelman, Max Wallen, Soren Nord, Sean Furlong, Stephen Mazafaro, Terry Hankamer, Tim Dakumar, and Vincent Garcia. So thank you once again for watching, and why not watch another video in this series because they're on screen now, they're there to be enjoyed, just enjoy them, they're there to be enjoyed.